Thank you, Seth, and good morning to everyone. It's good to see you. So grateful for the opportunity that we have to come and study God's Word together and to uh, to worship God together. I I really am always honored when I'm a part of this program. I don't know how many years I've uh, been a part of it, but it's always special uh, to me, and you're special, and I love this congregation very much. It's always good to see you. You know, when we think about the topic that we have this morning on the justice of God, you know, we have in the past two years witnessed unprecedented lawlessness in our country, complete disregard for people, for property, and it's astonishing, it's discouraging. Uh, to see what has taken place. Many have noted that one of the root causes of this behavior is a failure to respect our laws, a failure to respect those who make the laws, a lack of respect for those who enforce the laws. And so when you have that kind of disposition and attitude, you're going to see the kind of lawlessness that we are witnessing in various parts of the country. The headline that went with this particular picture that shows looters, and the headline said, looters raiding a store after San Francisco's no arrest policy. When the leaders of San Francisco announced that they would no longer arrest and prosecute those that stole less than $950, it brought about a predictable result. It's like, duh, who who never saw that coming? Well, nearly everybody did that thought about it, said, okay, you can steal up to $950, not arrested, not prosecuted. It's like, why don't you just open the door and invite everybody in and help yourself? It brought about a predictable result. Looting broke out everywhere. Crime skyrocketed. Business owners were forced to close their stores. Those store owners cried out for justice, but they didn't get any. The lawmakers had hung them out to dry. They had taken away a system of justice. And the law uh, lawbreakers went and they did their work. For any society to function, there needs to be laws. You know, Paul in Romans 13 makes it very clear that governments have been established by God in order to have laws to bring about a civil society. And if you don't have a government that is willing to create laws and enforce laws, then you're inviting chaos. You're inviting lawlessness. Paul said in Romans 13 that the government is a minister of God, an avenger who brings about wrath upon the one who practices evil. Romans 13 and verse 4. Clearly, logically thinking people would choose law over lawlessness. Most of you recognize this. Lady Justice. And there are four elements, if you've ever really looked into the uh, attributes of Lady Justice, basically four elements that are always, almost always present in her statues. One is the sword. The sword is a instrument upon which a, a guilty verdict was executed with a literal swing of the sword upon the neck of the accused. And the symbolism is used to convey the idea that when enforced, justice should be swift and it should be final. But swords are those that symbolize the idea of respect, denoting that justice stands by its every ruling and decision. But you'll notice that Lady Justice, not in this picture, but in many of them, that the sword is unsheathed. It's always transparent. It's never just an implement of fear, but she is most 
definitely prepared to use it. And it's a double-edged sword that indicates that rulings can always go either way, dependent on the circumstances, dependent upon the evidence that is presented by both parties. And then you see that she's blindfolded, was depicted without uh, any uh, implements, that the idea is objectivity and impartiality, assurance that anybody that approaches her is not going to be prejudged, but it's only going to be judged upon the evidence that is presented. And then she's holding the weighing scale. Without sight, the only way that Lady Justice can decide is tr with a thorough weighing of the evidence and the claims presented before her. Everything including what the law states and what jurisprudence dictates would be carefully and accurately discerned and weighed and balanced so that the, the right decision could be made. The fact that the scales hang freely from her grasp is symbolic of the fact that evidence should stand on its own without tangible foundation on speculation whatsoever. And then you have the toga. Just like the laurel wreath, the toga outfit is used to signify the mantle of responsibility the high level, the dignity, the respect, uh, the solemnity of the job that is at hand. When we think about our nation, and not only our nation, but other nations that are supposedly approaching the idea of law and order based upon the image of Lady Justice, but that brings us to the more important topic, and that is biblical justice. In Romans chapter 3, and verse 26, Paul makes an astonishing statement. And it's made on the heels of one of the more famous statements in the book of Romans. Romans 3.23 that says, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then three verses later, Paul makes this statement so that he would be just in the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Now, since we've all sinned, then we all share the same problem. We all recognize that we have this problem, that we have all sinned. Even Lady Justice would declare us guilty. We stand before God without an excuse. And that being the case, God being a just God is going to enforce a penalty for your sin and for my sin. You know, Paul said that God must be just. What exactly does that word mean? It's an interesting Bible word, and I've got the definition there, which is pertinent to being in accordance with high standards of rectitude, upright, just, fair. Now there's a lot to unpack in that, and we'll not have time to dig into all of that, but we have the idea that God is going to be a just God. That is a part of his nature. It is a part of his character. He is not going to to be an unjust, just God. If you have your New Testaments with you, I inv uh, invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 7. We want to read two different passages in Matthew chapter 7. Both of, <coughs> both of which are familiar to us. Verse 13 and 14, Matthew 7 Verse 13, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and many are those who enter by it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and few are those who find it. You know, when Jesus gave these teachings as he is finishing the greatest sermon ever preached, He's making the point that there are really only two ways, only two choices, only two roads that a person can go down. And we decide which road we're going to go down. 
And one road as described by Jesus is a broad road. It's an easy road. It's the road that most people are traveling on. And then you see this other road. It's hard. It's curvy. It's difficult. And you're thinking, I'm not sure I want to go on that road. But when we think about that illustration of the two roads and the concept of justice, God is going to judge based upon the road that you've chosen, the road that I've chosen. And the fact is, Jesus uses an interesting word about the broad road. Many, he said, are on that road. Well, so how does the justice of God apply? Well, Jesus said the many that have chosen that particular road are going to, and this is Jesus' word, destruction. You see, the justice of God is that which, if you choose to go the worldly route, the easy route, the non-spiritual route, then God is going to judge based upon that choice that you've made. And that's the choice that leads to destruction. Years ago, I ended up in somewhat of a controversial discussion with someone that was trying to prove that the churches of Christ are nothing but a cult. And the guy said, how many people do you think on the, the world are going to be saved? And I knew the question was a trap question. And so I, I chose to answer it this way. Few. That's what Jesus said. Well, how many is few? I don't know the answer to that. But few is few, as opposed to many. And so when we think about Jesus, if we believe that what Jesus teaches is the absolute truth, and we do, then we recognize that he said few, as opposed to many that are going the wrong direction. And then drop down in Matthew 7, a few verses, to verses 21 through 23. Jesus says, They're not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> but he who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven. Many, notice that word, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons? And in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare that to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. God's justice demands that his holy law be respected. It wouldn't be justice if God saved those who chose to ignore disobey God's law and follow their own law. You know, we have a saying, you do the crime, you do the time, right? You do the crime, you do the time. That's what's just and right and fair. No one made you sin. No one's made me sin. We're operating, all of us, on our own free will. And sadly, we exercise that free will against the law of God. Therefore, we deserve, as Paul's going to say later in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, the wages of sin is death. Ever thought about that word wages? You know, wages is something that you pay someone for uh, work done. Well, there are some that say, I, I just don't believe that God's going to send anybody to hell. Said, well, God's not going to send anybody to hell that haven't, hasn't asked to go there. What? He's not going to send anybody there that hasn't worked to go there. That's their wages. They have worked for that pay, and God says, or I'm going to pay you what you've worked for. Interesting, isn't it? The wages of sin is death. And so God is saying, that's what you've worked for. That's the kind of payment that you have wanted. And so now I'm going to give you that for which you have worked. The wages of sin is death. Well, when we think about 
what we have done and what we have deserved, it is true that our wages equally would be death. But there's more to this amazing verse 26 in Romans 3. It says that God is both just and the justifier of the one that has faith in Jesus. What does that word justifier mean? Well, according to lexicographers, it means to render a favorable verdict, to vindicate. All right, so God, on the one hand, is just. He is the one that is going to be true to himself. He's going to be true to his law. He's going to be true to his word, his promises. But on the other hand, Paul says that God wants to be the justifier. Have you ever noticed in James chapter 2, how James, in talking about the old law, you mess up one time, you're done. According to the demand of law, there had to be perfection, and one sin puts you in a category of you're a lawbreaker. You're not any different than the one that broke ten laws, or a hundred laws, or a thousand laws. You break one law, you're a lawbreaker, and so you stand, therefore, guilty of the crime of breaking God's law. But God, God wants to be the justifier, Paul says. You know, earlier we had talked about God's omniscience in this lectureship. God knows everything. He has a complete, perfect understanding of all that we have done. Unlike human judges that are going to have to render a verdict upon the evidence available, God has no such limitations. One of our graduates at Bear Valley Bible Institute in Denver actually is uh, a county judge in Colorado, and I, I talk with him all the time and, and um, I say, what's it like being a judge? How difficult is it? And he said, Denny, um, there are days that I'm, I'm just praying that I'm making the right decision. People's lives are in the balance, and I'm having to decide this way or that way based upon the evidence, and sometimes I don't think I've got the full story. Matter of fact, a lot of times I don't feel like I've got the full study story, but I've got to make a decision anyway. And then, as a judge, he made an observation about the judge of the universe. And he said, you really do appreciate knowing that our God is a judge with perfect knowledge, a full understanding, uh, a complete comprehension of everything that there is to know about a certain person and their life and their choice, the choices they've made in their life. So this just God, according to what Paul had said there in the book of Romans, inflicts wrath because his wrath was kindled by the unrighteousness of man. God had commanded faithfulness. We lived unfaithfully. God had commanded obedience. We have chosen disobedience. God wants us to follow his word. And Paul said there in Romans 2, 5, and 6, the the God who inflicts wrath is not unrighteous, is he? I am speaking in human terms. May it never be, for how will God judge the world? So God's not joking. He is serious. He's not just kidding around. He means what he says. There is a judgment day coming. There's a great day coming. A day of judgment is coming, and there will be many that will go to destruction. So what can we do? Because we're guilty as charged. Romans 3.23 encompasses all of it. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And so the answer brings us back to Romans 3.26. Notice carefully the wording at the end of verse 26. God is 
just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Wait. Faith in Jesus? And what else? Surely that isn't all there is. But that is all that there is. We already said that to justify means to render a favorable verdict. We didn't deserve a favorable verdict. Because we've all sinned. So God is both just and the justifier. He determined that the blood of Jesus could atone for our sins if we would just have faith in Jesus. And that brings us to one of the great Bible words, justification. How amazing, how incredible it is to think that God could treat us as if we had never sinned. Just a few weeks ago, we baptized a young man in his 20s back at Bear Valley. And he came out of the waters of baptism just sobbing with joy of his forgiveness. But that sobbing of joy later on that afternoon turned into sobbing of disbelief. And he said, Danny, I'm, I'm just having trouble believing that I'm really forgiven. I've done so much. I've been very sinful, very, very rebellious, and I am wholly undeserving of God's forgiveness. If this is where our faith is put to the test. Do we believe that we are now treated as if we had never committed a single sin? That's what the Bible says. That's what's wrapped up in this amazing word, justification. Treated just as if I'd never sinned. That's God's promise. That's God's promise, and it is ours to accept the promise of God by faith. As amazing as it is, and maybe even as difficult as it is to believe it, it's God's promise. And it's ours to accept it. Let's consider some lessons. First of all, God is just. This means that it is an immutable attribute of God. We've talked about that too this weekend. God cannot close his eyes to sin. He cannot ignore his own word. He cannot ignore the decrees that he's given. There are those on judgment day who are going to expect God to overlook their sinful behavior. To overlook the fact that they ignored what the Bible said. They ignored the church that Jesus built. They ignored the teachings, uh, admonitions found in the pages of God's word. Well, the justice of God will not allow him to overlook those choices. Because God is just. It is an attribute of God that he is not going to ignore. And so those who have chosen to live in defiance of his word are going to be quite surprised that God's not going to bend his rules on their behalf. Paul made a statement in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 13. If we are faithless, he remains faithful for he cannot deny himself. If we're faithless, if we are the ones <coughs> that have decided that we're not going to stay faithful to God, we're not going to do what God's word uh, says, we become faithless. God is not going to suddenly reverse his judgment and say, well, Denny, even though you're faithless, I've decided to save you anyway. Paul says he remains faithful. Notice the last part, because he cannot deny himself. God's commands are an extension of the very character and nature of God. For him to save someone who was, faith, who was faithless, would be to deny his very character. 
to deny what he has said in the Bible. And since God cannot lie, he cannot save someone whom he already said would be lost. Some of you might be familiar with or even have read a book written by a guy by the name of Rob Bell. The book was called Love Wins. And it was a very popular book. It sold, I don't know how many uh, millions. But the book basically is saying that because God loves, then love is going to win. And no matter what you've done, how bad you've been, how defiant you've been, love is going to win and everybody's going to be saved. But for that to be true, God would have to deny himself. And Paul says, that's not going to happen. It's something God, Paul says, cannot do. He cannot deny himself. His word is that which stood, that's, that stands and re continues to stand because it comes from a God who cannot lie. This is an example of the immutability of God. He will not change. He can't change and deny himself on what he has decreed. He can't do that. A second lesson, though, is moving on to this word that we talked about just a minute ago, justification. God has provided a way for us to be treated as if we had never committed a single sin. The idea is found in the word justification. And what is so amazing about this biblical doctrine is that we know better, don't we? We know the truth about ourselves. Think of it this way. If you only committed one sin a day and you lived for 60 years, one sin a day for 60 years, you will have committed 21,000 900 cents. One sin a day for 60 years. If you committed two sins a day, you would stand guilty of 43,800 sins over a course of 60 years. Now, well now I'm standing before God and I'm not being held guilty of a single sin. Then thousands of sins are something that I've committed in my lifetime. How can I believe that I'm being treated as sinless? Well, that's the wonderful truth that's found in this idea of justification. God is just, but he wants to be the justifier he wants all men to be saved, 1 Timothy 2 and verse 4. He doesn't want any to perish, 2 Peter 3 and verse 9. That's the way God is. When we look at that Romans 3 verse, justified freely through redemption which is in Christ Jesus, the third lesson is this justification is given to us freely, is found only in Christ Jesus. It's not found in Muhammad. It's not found in Joseph Smith. It's not found in Martin Luther. It's not found in any other person, male or female. It's found in only one way, and in only one way, and that's Jesus. Years ago, at one of the denominational conferences, there was a new president that was being nominated uh, and in his inauguration speech, they were anticipating him making a statement that now they are going to ha openly fellowship um, those who were Jews and that they were no longer going to say Jews were lost. Well, as he got up, he said, I know there are a lot of people that are anticipating a statement regarding uh, now our belief uh, regarding Jews. This was not a church Christ, it's a denomination. And he said, I have one thing to say about that. And then he quoted John 14 in verse 6. I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father 
but by me. One powerful verse answers the question about how do we have access to God. And our access to God is only through Jesus Christ. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21, He made him, that's Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus was the one that is boring our sin on the cross. Now we think about how can God justify? Because the reality is, I'm still guilty of those sins. And that's where this idea of redemption that comes into play. That we were repurchased by the blood of Christ. That God was willing to say, all right, Denny sinned, but I'm going to accept the sacrifice that Jesus made on his behalf. And so as I'm going into the jail cell of sin, Jesus steps in and says, I'll go in there on Denny's behalf. And Denny can go free. Now, is that fair? No. Is it right? No. I'm the one that did the crime. I, sh I should be going in there. But the marvel of the gospel, the good news, is that Jesus said, I've got this on your behalf. And what can you say but, thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you for giving yourself for me. You know, Paul said, that that justification is only because of the blood of Christ. You notice there in Romans chapter 3, the redemption is in his blood. When we think of Calvary, we think of the cross. We think of what Jesus went through there and the, the brutality of the trial, the brutality of the crucifixion that that was certainly the greatest act of love. And as Jesus shed his blood, the Hebrews writer would say, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. We had to have the blood of Jesus. And it's that blood of Jesus that provides our forgiveness. That's what Paul says in Ephesians 1 and verse 17. And so here we have in our denominational world today some confusion. Now, they'll acknowledge that they believe they're saved by the blood of Jesus. And that's the point to which we agree. The question is, how do we access or tap into that shed blood of Jesus? Well, Paul said in Acts, or Peter said in Acts 2 and verse 38, that you repent and are baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. All right, so if Ephesians 1, 7 says that it's the blood of Jesus that provides forgiveness, and Acts 2 and verse 38 says it's baptism that provides forgiveness, how do you merge those two verses together? Well, it answers the question, how do we get take advantage of the shed blood of Jesus that's for the forgiveness of our sins? So you say, all right, Denny, are you saying then that until a person is immersed in the waters of baptism, they have no benefit of Christ's shed blood? And the answer is yes. That's what scriptures are teaching. Years ago, in one of my first uh, uh, works in preaching was in Mississippi. Got a phone call one day from a guy that was a preacher of another uh, uh, a denomination in town that believed that you're saved at the point of faith. But he called and said, you Denny Petrillo? I said, yes. He goes, I understand you know Hebrew, the language. I said, yes, I do. And he said, I've always wanted to learn Hebrew. Would you teach me? I said, sure. His name was Steve, and Steve and I got together every Tuesday afternoon, and we studied Hebrew for several hours. And over the course of the next several weeks, uh, Steve and I became very very good friends. And so one day I said, Steve, is it possible for a person to be saved who is not yet forgiven? 
Is it possible for a person to be saved who's not yet forgiven? And I said, while you're thinking about that, look at Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. So he flips in his Bible to Acts 2 and verse 38, and he's thinking about the question, is it possible to be saved if you're not forgiven? And then he just goes, we'll all be. I said, what? He said, I have been teaching that wrong for years. He said, what, what have you been teaching that's wrong? He said, I've been teaching that a person is saved at the point of faith. But that's not what this verse says at all. The verse says that a person receives forgiveness, that's when they're saved, when they repent and are baptized. I said, Steve, that's great. You've got a, a whole congregation of people that have been taught incorrectly about that. What are you going to do about that? And this was his very tragic reply. I'm not going to do anything. I said, what do you mean? He said, grace will cover them. He said, no, Steve, grace will not cover them. Grace is for those who are trying to do what's right and fail. Grace is for those who look at the pages of God's word. They see that this is what God wants us to do. And I'm trying to do that. And I mess up occasionally. But I'm trying to do what's right. But for someone to say, oh, I know the Bible says I need to go to church, but I'm really not a church goer. Or I know the Bible says I need to be faithful to my wife, but I'm, you know, kind of a, uh, you know, guy that likes lots of women. Grace is not going to be given to those that look at what the Bible says and choose not to do it. There are people that see, the Bible says repent and be baptized. But I think God's going to save me anyway. I think I'm going to receive God's grace anyway. And you know the point is, getting back to Steve, and the people there on Acts 2 already believed. You ever thought about that? Peter ended the sermon saying, Let all the house of Israel know for certain that this Jesus whom you crucified... God has made both Lord and Christ. And they were pricked in their heart. And they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? They believed at that point. So why didn't Peter say, you're all good now? Now that you've come to faith, it's, it's all good. But it wasn't all good. It wasn't okay. They were at a point of faith, but they were not saved until they were baptized in the waters of baptism, because that is when we receive the benefit of the shed blood of Christ. Paul asked the question, Do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? This is because at baptism, that's when we're united with Christ. We're baptized into his death, and that death was done so that we might live. You know, I really am amazed at the resistance of so many to the doctrine of baptism. The pushback on what the Bible teaches about baptism. I don't, I don't get it, except that Satan is alive and well and, and uh, blinding the hearts of unbelievers. A fifth lesson is that we need to practice the obedience of faith. Having been freed from sin, God now calls on us to live faithfully. He gave us forgiveness. Now we give forgiveness to others. He gave us a chance to live. Now we need to live for Him. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Give ourselves as living sacrifices. That's what God is asking of us now. We need to be those who are walking in His will. God, God told us what to do. And so we, we joyfully do it. We embrace what it is that our God wants us to do. You know, last night we were talking about this idea of idolatry and worshiping false gods. And it was really a, a, a 
a good discussion and one that I needed to hear again. Because God needs to be our life. Not a part of our life, not a little chunk of our life. He doesn't get a little piece of our time. We're not Sunday only Christians, but we're 24-7. This is who we are. And our relationship with God is that we're constantly walking in His will. He's wiped away my thousands of sins. So I, des- I serve Him with all of my heart, all of my mind, all of my soul. I do not do so to earn my salvation because that's impossible. But out of gratitude, because I know that if I've committed 43,000 sins or whatever, God's washed those away and I can actually and you can actually stand before God and say, well, I'm looking at, God would say to you, I'm looking at your ledger and there's nothing on there at all. Not a single sin recorded. And I think, wow. Are you walking in His will this morning in your life? You know, the people on the day of Pentecost asked what they needed to do, and Peter told them. And that remains true for us today. To repent, be baptized for the forgiveness of sins, but baptized in the name of Jesus. That's where salvation is found. No other name given among men by which we can be saved. Acts 4 and verse 12. When we think about this idea of just and justifier. So on the one hand, just, God's not going to ignore his word. He's not going to bend it to save people that are living in defiance of him. But justifier means God so desperately wants to save you and me. And he's done all that he can do in order to make that happen through the death of his son. And so here we are with the the best of any conceivable possibility of salvation. And that's because of faith in Jesus. Grateful that God is just, but I'm also grateful that God is the justifier because I know I need it, I know that you need it. And so when we think about that great passage and the great truth of being taught about the attribute of God, here we are. Because of Jesus, we can stand before him justified, treated as if we've not committed any sin whatsoever. Amen to that. The beauty of the the gospel of Christ. Thank you for your attention this morning.